Charles Duhigg is a writer at The New Yorker and author of the new book, Super Communicators, How to Unlock the Secret Language of Connection. Welcome, Charles. First of all, explain to us what exactly is a super communicator you write in this book actually came about when you realized you weren't communicating well in your marriage. So I had this problem where I'd come home from work and I would complain to my wife about my day and she would give me this really good advice like, you know, take your boss out to lunch, get to know him better. And instead of being able to hear her, I would, you know, get upset and say, why aren't you supporting me? You're supposed to be on my side. And then she would get upset because I was attacking her for giving me good advice. And and I wanted to understand what was going on. And so I went out to researchers and I asked them, you know, why am I miscommunicating? I'm a professional communicator. And what they said is, well, look, we're living through a golden age of understanding communication. And one of the things that we know now is that we think of a discussion as being about one thing, but it's actually many different kinds of conversations. And in general, they fall, tend to fall into one of three buckets. There's practical conversations where we're solving problems, we're making plans together. But then there's emotional conversations where I tell you what I'm feeling and I don't want you to solve my feelings. I want you to empathize. And then finally, there's social conversations about how we relate to each other. And if you're not having the same kind of conversation at the same moment, that's when you miscommunicate. I was having an emotional conversation. My wife was having a practical conversation. And so we couldn't really hear each other. I know that. I know that. I'm often in practical. I'm always like, what's the solution? I don't really yeah. care about the feeling as much as the solution, which is interesting. So what, how, what do you see as the main reason? I mean, of course, it's hard to like say one reason that people struggle to communicate effectively. But talk about a few of them. It's usually because for a couple of reasons. First of all, that we don't, we're not having the same kind of conversation. Remember that, that wave of like tech CEOs doing layoffs over mm -hmm. Zoom? Mm -hmm. So obviously when you're laying someone off, that's an emotional conversation. And yet mm -hmm. they were treating it as a practical conversation. This mm -hmm. is why we're laying you off. Here's the benefits you're going to get. This is what's best for the company. Somebody hearing that they're being, that they're losing their job. They don't want to hear about the practicalities. They want to hear someone who empathizes with them. And so having the same kind of conversation at the same moment is critical. Another thing that's really important is asking more questions. Super communicators ask tw 10 to 20 times as many questions as the average person. And as reporters, we know this, right? The power of questions and, and particularly asking deep questions, questions that ask me about my values or my beliefs or my experiences. Like if you meet someone who's a doctor, instead of saying, where do you practice medicine? Saying, oh, what made you decide to go to medical school? That's an invitation for them to say something real. And then finally, the thing that super communicators do is they prove that they're listening. They ask follow-up questions that show they're paying attention. They might do this thing called looping for understanding where they repeat back what they heard you say. And when we feel listened to, that's when we become more likely to listen in return. Oh, that's an interesting technique. So that's so. What you've just said to me is no, um, no. Um, uh, You're very good at it. Uh, 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 yeah, no, I'm not. Do you want me to explain it to you, Carol? Yeah, yeah. That's what he does. Um, Scott. Go for it, Mister Communications. Uh, my, my it's, you, you've sort of outlined. My dad said, you know, my dad said this to me when he, uh, I was much younger, and I didn't register how important it was or how, how many subtleties to it. And it sounds like it's a lot of what your themes. You always used to say communication is with the listener. Can you talk about uh, something I didn't figure out until I was much older is the power of silence, just looking someone in the eye and make sure that you know that, that you are not waiting to speak, that you're, you're listening to them. Can you talk about the power of silence and sort of acknowledging the point, Absolutely. if you will? Absolutely. Creating those spaces for silence is critical. And, and what's interesting is that speaking is such a cognitively intense activity that oftentimes we don't really pay attention to how people are acting when we're speaking, right? And so the way that we create that silence or we create that proof of listening is when they stop talking what we do. For instance, think about how powerful it is if, if you just said something profound and someone says, wow, that gives me a lot, of, a lot to think about. Let me take a second just to think about what you just said. In that moment, what you're really doing is you're saying, I am listening to you. I promise I'm listening to you. And then if you ask a follow-up question, or if you say, here's what I hear you saying, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong. What we're doing is we're proving that we're listening. Because you're exactly right. Many people, particularly in a hard conversation, a conflict conversation, we suspect in the back of our head, this person isn't listening. They're waiting their turn to speak. And we have to prove that that's not what's happening. And when we do, it transforms a conversation. So, so one of the things you just talked about, reference Zoom communication, a lot of communication happens on text or video or social media which is a very different level of community, which is not about listening in any way. Some of the time it is, uh, but usually it isn't. Um, how does technology play into what we're writing about? Because often when Scott and I get into beefs, it's over a text 
You know what I mean? Like I'm thinking, um, which he takes the wrong way. No, one of us no. gets into a beef. The other just sits there and goes, what the fuck is she texting me for 3 a.m.? No, but then I don't when respond, we talk, Charles. When we I talk, listen. I'm the winner. I'm the no, super communicator not, no, here. No. I just listen. In any case, uh, we always solve it when we talk together. Always. Yeah. Even over the phone. Even over a phone. Which it makes typical. a huge difference, right? It, mm -hmm. In the book, there's a story about a CIA officer who, who's he's a terrible CIA mm -hmm. officer. He's sent over to Europe to try and recruit spies, and he's terrible at his job. Mm -hmm. And he learns this lesson, which is different types of communication have different rules and different strengths and weaknesses. And what's interesting is if you look at 100 years ago when phones became popular, there were all these articles that said no one will ever have a real conversation on telephone because you can't see each other face to face. And at the time, they were right. If you look at early transcripts, it's people using t phones like telegraphs or sending stock orders and grocery lists to each other. But of course, by the time we're in middle school and our kids, are, we can have phone conversations that are s some of the deepest conversations of our life. And it's because we learned how to use phones. And, and when you're talking on the phone, you tend to, without realizing it, overemphasize your words a little bit more. You put more emotion into your voice because you know the person can't see your expressions. And when it comes to digital communications, the same thing is true. There are certain rules. If I say something sarcastic to you, you can hear the sarcasm in my voice. If I type something sarcastic, you're going to take it seriously and you're going to be pissed off. And so we just have to remind ourselves of what those rules are, that there's some conversations that have to be telephone, have to be face-to-face. -face. And if we do them online, then we have to overemphasize politeness. We have to overemphasize emotion. We have to underemphasize sarcasm. What you, it, it, who are your, so first off, I think storytelling, um, someone asked me, what is the core confidence you would want to give to your kids? I've been thinking a lot about high school curriculums, and hands down, and, and I am going to buy your book and give it to my two sons. I think the confidence that will stand the test of time is yeah. storytelling. You're, you're on a podcast with two people who've made their living storytelling. What, if, if you buy into that, and you have sons or daughters, and you want them to become great storytellers, what what exercises or what hacks would you recommend for, for acquiring yeah, that Yeah, it's a skill? great question. And the first thing to understand is what happens when we communicate. So when we're in a conversation, the reason it's powerful, and, and communication is homo sapiens superpower, right? It is the thing that has set us apart from every other species. When we're talking to each other, our bodies start to match each other. Right? During this conversation, without us realizing it, our breath patterns are matching each other. Our heart rates are starting to align. And most importantly, the neural activity, the, the brain activity that both of us have, all of us have, are starting to mirror each other. And within that neurology, that's known as neural entrainment. And then when you think about it, it makes sense because if I describe an emotion to you, if I, if I describe an idea, you actually experience that idea or that emotion a little bit. That's what makes it powerful. And that's our brains aligning. So when it comes to storytelling, the thing to keep in mind is, my goal is not necessarily to tell you the most polished story on earth. My goal is to take you on a journey with me, right? Many people who, when they tell stories, they focus on the beginning and the end, but it's the middle, the journey through the middle that makes it a story. If you think about the movie Cinderella, the beginning is the parents, her father dies, that's two minutes. The ending is she lives happily ever after, that's like 45 seconds. The rest of the movie is the middle. And when we bring people on that journey, we invite them to align with us, to, in, to entrain neurologically. And that's incredibly powerful. But when people have less of an attention, obviously people have less attention now, and especially when they're distracted by a phone or whatever it happens to be. But distraction is certainly, you know, we're in a per persistent partial attention is where we all live now. Does that affect that? Because it's very hard to have. I've had many fewer longer conversations than I used to. I'm starting to talk like... I'm starting to tech, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you have, they're usually more logistical and that kind of thing. What happens in, in, in that space? And can people get, like you said, if you can adapt to phones, you can adapt to social media too, how Absolutely. to communicate well. Absolutely. Right. Well, I, I, and time is less important than, than authenticity. So if I tell you that like, you know, I had this incident with my wife and we couldn't hear each other. And I went to these researchers and I talked to them. That takes me 40 seconds to explain, but it's a little bit of a story. You get to come with mm -hmm. me. You get to envision me mm -hmm. and my wife not getting along. Cause that's probably something that happens with you guys and your wives, right? Mm -hmm. Never. And so, never, never. And so what I think what, hap what happens is that 
particularly when we're on social media, if we use social media as a way to simply broadcast, to scream, mm -hmm. rather than to interact, we'll fall into that pattern throughout our life because mm -hmm. it becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. And so the thing to do is to remind ourselves that the goal of a conversation is not to convince the other person that you are right and they are wrong. It's not to what? impress them. It's not, it's not for them to what? like you. The goal of a conversation is simply to understand how they see the world and speak in a way that they understand how you see the world. Uh -huh. And when you hold yourself to that standard, I'm not going to continue or discontinue this conversation until I can show, try and understand what you're saying and help you understand me. It makes everything healthier. Can I do a follow-up? We're obviously in election year. It seems like candidates are not that doing that. It's a dunk, dunk, dunk. No one ever listens, you know, even more so than anybody else of, of all of all, all public facing of people, they're the worst, I think. Is there anyone who's a super communicator that you see on the campaign trail? Well, what's really interesting is if you go to rallies, and, and this is true of both Trump and Biden, mm -hmm. and you pay attention to when they get off script, what mm -hmm. they're doing is they're proving that they're listen, right? Mm -hmm. Trump, Trump, you know, setting aside what he's saying and the craziness coming out of his mouth, when that audience applauds, he leans into the applause. He leans into whatever he's saying. That's why he starts saying all these crazy things. He's proving to them that he's listening to them. And Biden's doing the same thing in his rallies, and he's mm -hmm. trying to do it right now with his public statements. Mm -hmm. You're exactly right. One of the reasons I wrote this book is because we have forgotten how to communicate, right? Mm -hmm. This used to be taught in schools. Your, your parents took a course called Home Ec or Interpersonal mm -hmm. Relations, and as schools got more technical, it fell out of the curriculums. But this is important, and our brain is designed to be amazing at communication. If we teach it the right skills, it makes it into a habit very quickly. And so Super Communicators is about that handful of skills that we know helps mm -hmm. you connect with other people. Yeah, it's interesting. I do think you learn to communicate without talking. I, I Something I've learned of having smaller children is we talk a lot, but not speaking, right? You know yeah. what I mean? There's a lot of non-communication communication happening. Scott, Absolutely. final question. Yeah, just, Charles, I know very little bit about you. Do you have kids? I do. I have a 12-year-old and a 15-year-old. Oh, you're, you're, at, you're in the midst of it. You're in your second yeah. tour of Iraq and Vietnam right yes, now. Anyway, so that's exactly right. <laughs> what, uh, how has your study of being a super communicator and the, the best and worst practices changed the way you interact with your children? It's actually transformed it. The, the first thing is that I mentioned that deep questions. And what it, that really is, is it's about asking not about the facts of someone's life, but how they feel about their life. And I used to ask my kids, like, how was your day? Fine. Did you learn anything at school? No. Did you have fun? No. Right. You guys had this. Like, it's, it's like pulling teeth to have a conversation with them. And then I started asking, instead of about the facts of their day, I started asking, saying things like, hey, I know that you hung out with Jasper after school. Like, what do you admire about Jasper? Why do you like him? And suddenly it's like opening this book. You know, my kid is like, oh, he's very courageous. What does courage mean? It, well, he rode his bike off the roof. <laughs> like, oh, is that courage? Or what else has he done? Oh, it, it turns out Jasper can talk to girls. And I prove that I'm listening to them. I ask them these deep questions about how they feel about their life because they're experts in that. And then I repeat back to them. I say, oh, that's interesting. What do you mean by courage? I prove to them that I'm paying attention, that I want to learn from mm -hmm. them. And they're not annoyed and by opened... that? They're not annoyed. No, they love yeah. it. They love it, right? I mean, you have older kids, Carrie. Yeah. You know, like when they're teenagers, they, they're, they're just bursting at the seams to be experts on things and to sure share their expertise are, yeah. with you. And the, th the thing they're an expert on is their own life. Yeah. That is fair. True. That's true. So uh, give us a little review here. Are Scott and I super communicators? You guys are super communicators, Park Extraordinaire. I mean, the thing is, I've been listening to some of the podcasts that yeah. you've been doing, Kara, about um, for your yeah. book. And and the thing I love about it is that you go in and you have something to say, mm -hmm. right? You ha you, you're you coming in not just waiting for a question. You're coming in with something you want to share. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're also listening to that host. You're interacting mm -hmm. with them. And you guys might not walk away completely agreeing with each other, mm -hmm. but you walk away understanding and connecting with yeah, each other. Yeah. So you guys, you guys are definitely super. And give us one, give yeah, give right. everybody one quick tip before we go. What's the one thing you yeah. have to do? The one thing you have to do is today, ask a question that you wouldn't have asked otherwise, and make it a question that feels to you like it's personal. Uh, like Scott does know, that well. Yeah, yeah. Why did why did you decide to become a journalist? Mm -hmm. Like, what was it like growing up wherever you grew mm -hmm. up? What do you love about your neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Those questions are an invitation to someone yep. else 
to tell you who they really yeah, are. Yeah, I think I told Scott this as uh, something Louis does, my son does. He, everyone he asks, and I borrowed it because I think it works really well. He, he looks at someone he doesn't know and he says, how's your day going? And I have to tell you, it changes dynamics constantly where we're at rather yeah. than just rush past them. Um, and he actually looks at them and I think it's one of those really, I was like, wow, that was, it, it works, it works. It's powerful. It is, very much so. Anyway, Charles Duhigg, Super Communicators, How to Unlock the Secret Language of Connection is out now.